Good evening, and welcome to another installment of the Hidden History of Doty Island. The Nina Historical Society and the Menasha Historical Society have worked collaboratively to present these programs to you. I'm Jane Lang, the director of the Nina Historical Society, and we're working together with Kathy Humsky and Nick Jevney from the Menasha Historical Society to present this program tonight. Later on, I'll introduce um, Tom Van Leeshout, who has done the bulk of the work on this presentation, and we think you'll really enjoy it. The topic tonight will be railroads and depots. What's fascinating about Nina and Menasha, one of the many fascinating things, is the fact that we share an island. And we think it's interesting to discover some of that hidden history of Doty Island. We've presented several programs in the past um, covering this series, and this map shows you that. This is a 1938 aerial map of Doty Island. You can see Nicolet Boulevard running right down the middle of the island, and then the locations of some of the programs that we've already discussed. The stars um, on the map on the slide you're looking at now are where we'll be focusing our attention tonight. Some of the programs that we've already done, and these programs are available on our YouTube channel and the Menasha Historical Society's YouTube channel as well, but some of the topics we've covered are the Whiting Boathouse, Picnic Island, Roberts Resort, the Memorial Building, the Winnebago Day School, Winnebago Players, the Driving Park, the Barn, and the Doty Tennis Club, the two tennis clubs on the island, the Racquet Club, also known as the Barn. Gilbert Paper Company and the Bonta Corporation, and Samuel A. Cook and the Cook Armory. All of these topics have uh, that theme in common, that their history is somewhat hidden. And that's what's exciting about this program series. We're informing you about some of the locations and stories of the island that have become hidden to us over time but we hope that you'll have an exciting time um, along with us as we reveal some of that hidden history. And with that, I will be turning it over to Tom Van Leeshout. Thank you, Jane. And I'd also like to welcome you to this video presentation. It's a pleasure to present this whole series, The Hidden History of Doty Island. Tonight, the main focus will be the railroads and their depots, focusing on how important Doty Island has been to this transportation industry. This evening, we will present the story in three sections, the island and the lasting structures, the railroad systems and the depots. Before I begin with the details, let, let me introduce myself and explain how I fit in to the island story. As Jane mentioned, I'm Tom Van Leeshout, born at Theta Clark, lived on Hewitt Street in Nina and Nicolet Boulevard in Menasha. I graduated from St. Patrick's grade school. All in all, I lived my first 25 years on the island. In this first section, we'll discuss Doty Island's role in, br br in bringing the rail service to the Twin Cities. We'll also point out some current structures that are still standing on the island and around the area. These structures will give you an appreciation of the 100-year history with freight and passenger rail service. Let's begin this hidden history presentation with the words of an uncle to his nephew. Here are excerpts from a personal letter written in 1856, five years before the railroad line would come to Nina. My dear nephew, I have been waiting to hear from you and our Uncle Johnson for a long time and today have mailed him a letter enclosing my draft of $50 for you and I have asked him to name some person to whom I might forward the watch by express to you. The above picture is a view of this village taken by a designer in a major street near, nearly opposite of the old grist mill. We have several new amendments this spring which add to our business very much. Our flowering mills give us quite a business appearance. 
there is now talk of the Lake Superior Railroad Depot being located on the island. If it should, it would make the island's property very valuable. In the summer of 1856, excitement was running wild in Enamanasha. A railroad was in the planning stages. It was extended from Oshkosh to Appleton. Upon, uh, up until then, the rail lines only ran from Milwaukee to Oshkosh. Late in October, engineering crews surveyed the 17-mile stretch. In November, a large exploring party employed by Lake Superior Railroad were in Appleton to examine several projected routes for the rail lines. Loyal Jones saw the importance of the railroads and the depots to his business and to Doty Island. A decade earlier, in 1847, Loyal was credited with opening the first store in Nina and owned grist mills on the river. A grist mill grinds cereal rain, grain into flour and was Nina's biggest industry at the time. The Jones family, along with the Reed and Doty families, were considered the most influential in the founding of Nina and Menasha. We will concentrate on the Reed's railroad contribution in this presentation. A land grant secured by Judge George Reed is an example of the valuable roles the Reeds and Doty Island played. A land grant titled Doty Island to Lake Superior helped Menasha secure a place in railroad history by establishing the Wisconsin Central Railroad. The National Hotel, lower right, in downtown Menasha opened Thanksgiving 1870. During the months of December and January, several meetings between multiple railroad companies took place. On February 4th, 1871, in this hotel, these organizations merged to form the Wisconsin Central Railroad. This plaque was placed on the old Menasha Hotel, upper right, the successor to the National Hotel, to commemorate this historical event. The first spike of the Wisconsin Central Railroad was put down on January 21st, 1871 on Doty Island. Later, on October 2nd, the maiden journey from Wapaka started on Doty Island at the Wisconsin Depot taking three hours and 45 minutes. This is how the train ride was described in the Nina Citizen and the Menasha Register. The inaugural run of the Wisconsin Central included the editor of the Menasha Press who recorded the trip that departed from Doty Island. At precisely one o'clock, the whistle sounded. Invited guests and scores of spectators thronged to the depot platform to catch a glimpse and grasp the hand of our honest Governor Taylor and all other distinguished representatives of our state whom their votes had elected to position. And there we were, plunging and thundering like a creature of life, proud of its mission and honored with its burden, come dashing along the wondrous Baldwin, pulling her palace coaches freighted with as jolly a set of honorable as the most vivid imagination could picture. Once underway, the state and local dignitaries were served a sumptuous meal. Roast meat, oysters in various styles with all the ends that the imagination of an expert could possibly suggest to allure the taste were artistically arranged upon the extended table. After the repast was enjoyed, even though taken on the wing at the rate of 20 miles per hour, toasts and responses were considered in order. In 1971, this Wisconsin Central caboose was donated to the Menasha Historical Society by the current owners of Wisconsin Central, the Sioux Line Railroad. This was in dedication of the 100-year anniversary of the founding of Wisconsin Central at the National Hotel. The Sioux Line donated the caboose and laid the track to its authenticity. The caboose now stands as a memorial to our railroad past in Smith Park on the island.
George Bonta Jr. donated financial support for the shelter to house the caboose. The shelter, designed to replicate the old Menasha Sioux Line Depot, protects the caboose from the elements and adds to its charm and longevity. St. Mary's Cemetery in Menasha has an operating rail line running through it. This fact has been rumored to be included in Ripley's Believe It or Not series. We're still attempting to secure a copy of the original Believe It or Not publication. The land located on the east side of Little Lake Butamore was once farmland owned by Amos D. Page, who you can see on this slide. In 1877, the Milwaukee Northern Railroad laid the rails. On June 4, 1880, Mr. Page sold the land to the Green Bay Diocese for $425. It contained four and a half acres and one half acre to the east and four acres to the west of the railroad. St. Mary's immediately began to utilize this property for funeral rites, reinterring some of the parishioners from the St. Patrick Cemetery, then known as the Catholic Cemetery. Twice in the mid-1900s, additional land was purchased for the cemetery on the southeast side of the tracks. In the early years of the cemetery, it had no main entrance or access to the property. Therefore, the public would walk the rails to get to the cemetery. A railroad tower housed a gate man who manually raised and lowered crossing gates to stop traffic when a train was coming. They were elevated so the gatemen could see down the tracks over the traffic and other low-level obstructions. In Nina, on Winniconnie Avenue and Main Street, was a 25-foot Sioux Line crossover tower built in 1955. The tower, furnished with an iron coal stove, a stool, a chair, crank-operated phone, and a light bulb suspended from the ceiling, was manned 24 hours a day. The article on the upper left of the slide showcases John Mayer of Menasha as he retires with 25 years of service with the railroad, the last nine of which were in this tower. In 1973, Wisconsin Public Service Commission ordered installation of updated and improved warning signals. These new signals would include cantilevered automatic flashing light signals with short arm gates. The elevated crossing tower was disassembled in 1989 and is now on display at Mid-Continent Railroad Museum in North Freedom, Wisconsin. If you have ever walked or biked over the Trestle Trail, you've covered the same ground that many freight and passenger trains have traveled for decades. The first railroad bridge across Little Lake Butamore was constructed in the summer of 1862 by the village of Menasha, who provided $12,500 in municipal bonds for the project. This single track wooden railroad bridge served until 1909. When the railroad announced it was going to double track the main line, the bridges in Nina and Menasha would have to be rebuilt using steel and concrete. Work on the bridge started in July of 1909 as, and was completed in 1910. The bridge has 33 steel spans each 46 feet, four and a half inches long for a total length of 1,530 feet. The Menasha record commented upon its completion. The new bridge is expected to last a lifetime. Over the years, streamlined passenger trains with names like Valley 400, Peninsula 400, and the North Woods Fishermen crossed Little Lake Butamore Bridge and stopped at the Nina Menasha Depot on Doty Island. While those exciting railroad days are gone forever, the bridge will continue to serve the public as the prominent feature of the Trestle Trail. Doty Island had four railroad depots. Two depots are still standing, though not operating as train depots. The Milwaukee Northern Depot, built in 1882, is a 20 by 50 foot wood structure. The station was built upon a redwood beam which serves as its foundation. The floor in the building, while built on the beam, 
is independent of the walls of the structure. This added some architectural inge ingenuity to the construction at the time. Located on the east side of the track, it is between East Forest Avenue and High Street. It handled both passenger and freight commerce. Ownership would change throughout the years to the Chicago Milwaukee St. Paul Railroad and then to the Milwaukee Railroad. The Milwaukee Railroad phased out the freight office service from this depot in 1960. In 1964, the Nina Menasha Railroad Club, Club signed a five year lease with the, with the Milwaukee Railroad. The depot has been their clubhouse ever since. Today, it is the home of the Menasha Nina Railroad Club. Membership of the club is always open. Anyone interested in the railroads can apply. Club, club members build miniature versions of the railroads, towns, inside the building. Over the, over the years, they've assembled over 800 feet of track, plus buildings, bridges, and mountains. 250 O-scale railroad freight cars and engines, many built from scratch by club members, run on five separate tracks throughout the building. Miniature towns, railroad depots, factories, cars, and people surround the tracks, which curl around the ground floor, climbing up to the second floor. Club members assemble on Wednesday and Thursday evenings to the sound of steam and diesel engines filling the air. In addition, they built a real-life exhibit, a miniature version of the depot itself. Also still standing is the Chicago Northwestern Depot. Originally completed in 1892, this passenger depot was constructed in Victorian Romanesque style, strategically located, straddling the line between Nina and Menasha. The foundation is Duck Creek Stone, the rest of the structure was constructed with Bayfield brownstone and St. Louis pressed brick. The roof was black slate with copper trimmings, supported by brackets and projected out over the walls by 10 feet. The interior was finished in oak. The northernmost area was the express and baggage area, built under the same roof. The depot was similar to others at the time, but while others offered a structure for trains to pass through, this depot offered an outdoor platform. A water tower was built 50 feet to the north. It was the only southern passenger train water tower between Green Bay and Milwaukee. Passenger service at the depot lasted until the spring of 1971 when Amtrak took over between Green Bay and Milwaukee. Fortunately, this historic land, uh, landmark is still in existence. In 1991, the depot was sold and extensively remodeled in 1994. During this renovation, care was taken to ensure the building kept its original charm and historic value. Today, various pictures and mementos of the original station are featured in the lobby. We will cover the depot, this depot in greater detail later in this presentation. Now let's take a look at the establishment of the rail system in Nina Menasha and the driving forces behind it. In this section, we'll discuss specifically the rail system covering what was the spark that started it, who were the local power brokers, and the main railroads in our, in our area, Wisconsin Central, Sioux Line, the Milwaukee and Northern, and Chicago Northwestern. In this discussion, our focus will to be keep it as simple as possible as with all of the reorganizing, leasing, merging, and consolidations can be extremely confusing. As our founding fathers of the Twin Cities foresaw, the need for this new industry was important to the, to the area's survival. Rail was coming into its own with the 1862 Pacific Rail Act. A trans transcontinental railroad will soon be a reality. This new industry will change the country forever. In the mid-1800s, rail service was slowly working its way through the state. Energies and finances 
to expand the rail system were being diverted to the Civil War effort. Also, the cost of running rail through the Northwood wilderness was high and capital became harder to find to fund the projects. At the same time, the government was cutting military wagon roads through the northern forest. This was financed in part by land grants where the government gave the road builders timber and land close to the roads. They were finding that transporting war material through stump choked wagon roads was slow. So in 1864, the U.S. Congress offered similar land grants to encourage several proposed railroad building projects from Portage through the center of the state to Lake Superior. This was called the Minnesota Land Grant. Chapter 80 specifically included Wisconsin. Here is a portion of Chapter 80 in the Minnesota Land Grant from 1864. Be it enacted by the Senate and House of Representatives of the United States of America in Congress assembled that there be and is hereby granted to the state of Wisconsin for the purpose of aiding in the construction of a railroad from a point on the St. Croix River or Lake between townships 25 and 31 to the west end of Lake Superior and from some point on the line of said railroad to be selected by said state to Bayfield, every alternative section of public land designated by odd numbers for 10 sections in width on each side of said road, deducting any and all lands that may have been granted to the state of Wisconsin for the same purpose by the Act of Congress of June 3, 1856, upon the same terms and conditions as are contained in the Act granting lands to the state of Wisconsin to aid in the construction of railroads in said state, approved June 3, 1856. The process of securing grants, bonds, financing, and building the rail lines is very complex. There were three important men involved with securing the financing and building the organization of the Wisconsin Central based in Menasha. Matthew Wadley, born in Quebec, moved to Stevens Point in 1860. There he formed a partnership with his father-in-law and erected a sawmill on the Big Plover River six miles from Stevens Point. As business grew, he bought pine lands and everything pertaining to the lumbering business. He took a deep interest in bringing a railroad through Stevens Point. Curtis Reed, born in Massachusetts, was an American businessman and politician in Wisconsin. He moved to Menasha in 1845. There he helped Charles Doty, a state legislator, with surveying the land. He also helped develop the Fox River area and Doty Island. Reed, a two-term mayor of Menasha, owned a grist mill, steamboat, and built a sawmill. George B. Reed, Curtis's older brother, also born in Massachusetts, was a lawyer, a state senator, and a judge. He was believed to be the first attorney to move to the Wisconsin Territory. Reed served in the first Wisconsin Constitutional Convention of 1846 and in the Wisconsin Territorial House of Representatives in 1847 to 1848. Eventually, he moved to Manitowoc in 1850. The Reed sister, Martha, was married to Alexander Mitchell. He happened to be the financier and owner of the Chicago, Milwaukee, and St. Paul Railroad. These three individuals were involved with, de with developing several organizations with a purpose to develop railroads over specific geographical areas. Let's explore some of what these three businessmen, politicians, and legislators developed. Two companies were established in 1866 to take advantage of the land grants the U.S. Congress was offering. The first corporation, the Winnebago and Lake Superior Railroad Company, was chartered to build from Menasha north to Lake Superior through the Stevens Point area. This railroad was headed by Judge George Reed of Manitowoc. The second corporation, the Portage and Superior Railroad Company, 
intended to be built from the city of Portage north to Lake Superior through Ripon and Stevens Point. The two railroads were consolidated in 1869 to become the Portage, Winnebago, and Superior Railroad Company. There were certain criteria to be fulfilled in order to secure and receive the land grants. A railroad needed to be organized, the route needed to be surveyed, and rail needed to be laid. None of these early railroad companies laid track, but their merger provided the corporate structure to move forward. The next step was to complete a survey of the proposed route. A party of 12 men completed the survey in eight months. They received the right to the land grant, but they needed the financing to lay the rail. Another corporation involved, the Manitowoc and Minnesota Railroad, was headed by Judge Reed. This corporation was organized to develop a rail from Manitowoc to La Crosse through Menasha. The efforts of these men were duplicated all over the state and nation, developing plans to build rail lines from their communities and connect with larger cities. Let's look at the four main railroads that were built in this area. The first one that we'll look at is the Wisconsin Central Railroad Company, also known as WC. The Wisconsin Central was a major early railroad that operated throughout northern Wisconsin. It, it built lines through the North Woods and opening large tracts of land for logging and settlement. The WC has special meaning to the Twin Cities as it was founded in Menasha. As Jane mentioned, in the late 1860s, three railroad companies were merging. Judge George Reed was the dreamer, planner, promoter, and guiding hand for these difficult mergers. He also secured the land grant to build the railroad from Doty Island to Lake Superior. They granted, the right, uh, they granted the right to the land, but it paid only after the track was built. So they also needed money to get the project rolling. Judge Reed went out east looking for financing and found it in Boston. Gardner Colby's group agreed to finance the rail, locomotives, and the cars. The village and town of Menasha offered $50,000 in bonds, Wapaka $30,000, and Wyawega $40,000. A project team was developed to begin plans to build the tracks. General headquarters for the project was established in January 1870 at the new National Hotel in Menasha. Board of directors included the Reed brothers and Matt Wadley. Construction began June 15, 1871, with Reuben Scott of Menasha overseeing the first 63-mile leg to Stevens Point. Two subcontractors cleared and graded the rail bed, employing as many as 2,000 men, 600 horses, and 300 yoke of oxen. Lower right is a 35-ton Baldwin engine named Menasha. It was one of five off, uh, ordered and delivered in 1871. They were adorned in green, gold, and red paint with shiny brass bands around the boiler. The second railroad line that we'll look into is the Sioux Line. The Sioux Line was credited for a singular, uh, was, was created for a singular purpose, to improve Minneapolis-St. Paul's transportation choices. This region along the upper Mississippi River grew into booming flower producing area thanks to the Falls of St. Anthony, which offered millers a ready-made source of power. With the local millers owning 75% of the Sioux Line, its purpose was to bypass Chicago and reach the East Coast by connecting with Canadian systems through the Sioux St. Marie Gateway. The company receives its name, the Sioux Line, from the phonetic spelling of Sioux in Sault Ste. Marie, a French word meaning waterfall or rapids. In northern Wisconsin, excuse me, in northern Minnesota and Wisconsin, the Sioux Line built extensions to bolster its position in the market. One noteworthy addition was the thousand mile Wisconsin Central Rail Railway. In 1909, the Wisconsin Central was leased to the Sioux Line. 
and eventually bought out in 1961. As you can see from the lower left, just like the Wisconsin Central Railroad, local corporations were consolidating into larger organizations. The organization we know as the Sioux Line was formed by these continued acquisitions. The third line we'll cover is the Milwaukee and Northern. This organization also had close ties with the Wisconsin Central. The Milwaukee and Northern was granted a charter by the legislature of Wisconsin in February of 1870. Soon after, 70, 79 miles of Milwaukee and Northern track was laid from Cedarburg to Gilbert Junction and then to Menasha. In conjunction, the Wisconsin Central Railroad in order to gain connection to Milwaukee, the village of Menasha issued $60,000 in bonds to underwrite the cost of the construction. The Milwaukee and Northern Menasha branch was extended to Nina in 1881. For 10 years, the Milwaukee and Northern was leased by, the Chicago, by Wisconsin Central Railroad in the late 1880s. The picture on the right is of the Milwaukee Northern engine number 18 idling at the Wisconsin Central Menasha Depot. In October of 1890, the Milwaukee and Northern was sold to Chicago, Milwaukee, St. Paul and Pacific, and then later became the Milwaukee Railroad. The first railroad to reach Nina was the Chicago Northwestern, which came in 1861 as part of the expansion of the road from Oshkosh to Appleton and then on to Green Bay. These rails were laid over the current roadbed built in the 1700s. The first freight shipment out of Nina was 100 barrels of flour. Chicago and Northwestern's original path was along the western shore of Little Lake Butamore, bypassing most of Nina and all of Menasha. Local manufacturers, particularly those in Menasha, were understand understandably outraged but the railroad refused to pay the cost of building bridges over all of the locks and canals. Menasha developed a railroad committee to discuss getting the railroad to build across Doty Island. Voters approved $12,000 in municipal bonds to aid the railroad in altering the route. In 1862, the villages of Nina and Menasha paid for the right-of-way, grading, ties, and bridges as an inducement for the railroad to reroute its line across Doty Island. The first railroad bridge across Little Lake Butamore, constructed for the Chicago Northwestern by the village of Menasha, was completed December of 1862. This will later be known as the Trestle Trail. The original track of the line through the cities has been changed over the years and is currently not being used. However, the city of Nina saved a portion of it. Near the Nina Library in Shattuck Park, you can still see the route as it runs through Doty Island to the Trestle Bridge. There's a short, short portion used a couple times a year for Nina paper as they receive parent rolls via the rail. We have zoomed in on the 1938 aerial view of the island. It shows the extension funded by both cities to connect with the mainline Chicago Northwestern on the western side of Little Lake Butamore. Here, highlighted in yellow, is that rail line as it went through Nina, Doty Island, Menasha, and then to the Trestle Bridge. Built in 1862, upgraded in 1910. We just showed you photos of a portion saved by the city of Nina. In red is that rail line. You can access it by behind the Nina Library as it goes to the depot. With the Chicago Northwestern, the Twin Cities now had access to Chicago and Green Bay. Wisconsin Central gave them access to the West and Minnesota and Milwaukee with the Milwaukee and Northern. As the founding fathers knew, the railroads would be crucial to the growth of the Twin Cities. 
Now that Nina Menasha had access to more distant markets and raw materials, business grew and expanded. In freight statistics, notice in the right shows how business actually growing through the new Nina Menasha Depot in January of 1867. 2,000 tons per month, flour the main commodity. On the left are the stats 14, year later, 14 years later, shipping out of both Wisconsin Central depots in Nina Menasha up to 11,000 tons per month. We all know how the wood products and paper industry capital, capitalized on the new access. Menasha Woodenware is a perfect example of the organization that was able to grow from this new rail industry. The upper 1905 picture is one of the many oversized circus boxcars Charles Smith, Charles Smith bought to ship their products. They were painted in signature Kelly Green and were 10 feet high to add more freight per square foot. The lower picture is a miniature version built at the Nina Menasha Railroad Club. Here is an excerpt from the dedication of the caboose at Smith Park, noting the role that the railroads, specifically Wisconsin Central, played in the growth of industry. In our early days, one of the principal industries was woodenware products. The chief of these was the famous Pale Factory, founded by Elisha D. Smith in 1849. By 1871, this factory employed over 250 hands, and it was producing over 2,000 pails a day, plus a wide variety of wooden containers, ranging all the way from butter tubs to fish pits. In 1875, it was incorporated as the Menasha Woodenware Company, and eventually became known as the largest turned woodenware factory in the world. If this factory, along with the other woodenware industries of the area was to survive, a steady flow of lumber was required. The great forests of the North Woods had this supply, and not only did the railway bring it to the waiting mills, but it also helped to transport the finished products to the waiting markets of the North and West, and eventually to the entire nation. The rail system is only part of the story. If the trains just rolled by our city, you would not be able to take full advantage of the benefits. You must have a place for the trains to stop, pick up and drop off passenger and freight, fuel up, or fill its tanks with water. The next section will explore the depots of Nina Menasha, especially the four that were on Doty Island. In this section, We'll cover the local depots from Milwaukee, North, and Milwaukee Northern, the Wisconsin Central, the Sioux Line, and the Chicago Northwestern. We will end the presentation with the activities surrounding our premier depot on Doty Island. The first depot we'll look into is the one we mentioned earlier, Nina's Milwaukee and Northern Depot. This structure on Doty Island is the current home of the Nina Menasha Model Railroad Club. Upon its opening, the Nina City Times wrote, Nina is bound to monopolize the depots and railroad facilities in, the, in this part of Winnebago County. The paper was overjoyed with the new facility, emphasizing its size and its welcoming appeal. The station was built in 1882 as a freight and passenger depot. The last passenger boarded in 1920s, the last freight shipped in 1960. The Menashe's Milwaukee and Northern Depot was on 315 Racine Street, the east side of Racine Street between 3rd and 4th Streets. Its structure was very similar to the Nina building. It was built in 1872, a one-story rectangular structure with a unique asphalt gabled roof and waterboarding siding. Renovations to the waiting area in 1882 provided a larger baggage room and updated waiting rooms. The Milwaukee and Northern Engine House was set back a bit more to the east. In the 1887 article, Upper Center, 
they were already promoting the comfort of riding in their elegant Pullman streetcars. In the 1930s, the depot sponsored special trains to Wrigley's, Chicago's Wrigley Field to watch the Cubs. Package deals included railroad tickets and box seats for the game. Trains left at 7 a.m. and returned 11.30 p.m. The railroad sold the building and the property in the mid-1970s. The next 20 years, the building was used as a storage warehouse. In 1995, when plans were underway to build a Walgreens, a year-long effort was made to preserve it as a historical site or move to a new location and convert it to a historical museum. Major structural issues made the effort to save the building too costly. The 125-year-old depot was torn down in 1995, and the subway is currently on the site today. Also on Racine Street, to the west of the Milwaukee and Northern Depot was the Wisconsin Central Depot. This was the depot that, in 1871, was the start of the inaugural trip from Menasha to Wapaka, sort of. The history of this building is very interesting showing the early tensions between the two cities. You see, the facility actually had two homes. In 1871, it was located on Doty Island, where First Street and Hewitt Street converge to Commercial Street. To qualify for the government land grant, the company was empowered to build the depot. Each city offered $50,000 in bonds, and a site was chosen. Early on, the cities had a dispute over the provisions in the agreement, specifically the bonds. So in early 1872, Wisconsin Central found 20 acres of land in Menasha to better suit them and the Milwaukee Northern. This is why the, the two depots were built in the same area at the same time. The building on the island was torn down board by board and rebuilt in Menasha. The Wisconsin Central offered special trains to service local citizens. In 1891, Chris Walter, owner of Walter Brothers Brewery in Menasha, chartered a special tra uh, train through five cities, bringing guests to celebrate his parents' 50th wedding anniversary. In 1917, 162 men of Company E were sent on a special train for service in France during World War I. They made their way to Camp Douglas via Stevens Point, picking up the Wapaka Company on the way. Passenger traffic out of this location saw many perks. The Pullman dining cars serving this location were named after famous New York restaurants, Delmonico and Hoffman. They served an excellent hot meal for 50 cents. No tips were allowed for the waiters. This service was offered from Chicago to Ashland. Meals were so inexpensive because the railroads used the experience to draw passengers in. Take note of the items visible in the photo on the right. St. Mary Spire, the rail, rail yard of Milwaukee Northern, and the engine house can be seen. Time took its toll on the building because it needed to be modernized. In 1922, it was replaced. The brick facility was built in 1922, replacing the original wood structure. The new facility serving Menasha business, served Menasha's business community and public well. In 1932, both St. Mary's and Menasha High School bands were provided special trains to travel to the state tournament in Wisconsin Rapids. The year before, in 1931, the Menasha Band and sponsors and supporters were offered a special train as it made its way to Tulsa, Oklahoma for nationals. The return trip from Tulsa was thrilling one because they won the national title. A miniature version of this depot is on display at the Menasha Historical Society. The artist paid special attention to all the detail and was built to perfect scale. In 1967, the city of Menasha and local businesses were battling the Sioux Line and the Public Service Commission 
about the decision to close, saying it was not in the public's best interest. The controversy brought back memories of the 1872 feud between Nina Menasha, which brought the depot to this location in the first place. The city of Menasha lost and saw the transferring of the freight handling functions to Nina. The irony, irony of the whole year-long battle was the next year, in 1968, the Sioux Line closed the Nina facility. The facility was demolished and replaced with Sioux Line offices and a 60,000 square foot warehouse. The Nicolay National Bank is currently on the site. Nina's Wisconsin Central Depot was built in 1882 between Sherry and Main Streets. Sherrytown, named for lumberman Henry Sherry, was a perfect place to locate a depot as this was the neighborhood where Pioneer Flour, Grist Millers, and Lumber Companies were located. In 1885, the Nina Times reported on the details of a coming improvement for the city, a street railway between Nina and Menasha. Along with this new system came a request to correct silly misstatements made in another concern, calling it the Menasha and Nina Railway. The charter called for a two-mile single track running from the Menasha WC to Nina's WC Depot, operating on the main streets. Not only could railroads create issues to divide cities, they had ways to bring them together as well. The system became operational July of 18. 86. In October of 1912, while on a presidential campaign, Teddy Roosevelt made a stop in Nina. A crowd of over 1,000 people stood in the pouring rain, waiting for the former President Roosevelt's train to arrive. A mighty cheer went up as the train pulled into the station. Roosevelt, running for the Bull Moose Party, spoke from the rear platform for several minutes and then moved on to Oshkosh for a dinner. As time moved on, the 1882 building became obsolete and in need of substantial upgrading. In 1952, it was torn down after its replacement building had become operational. Replacing the old structure in the same vicinity, the new Sioux Line Depot was situated between Main and North Lake Streets. The address was 417 Main Street. This $100,000 structure was one of the most modern at the time. Passengers were able to sit on Davenports and chairs rather than traditional benches. It was constructed of concrete, block, stone, and steel. It had spa a spacious waiting area, glassed-in ticket office, baggage room, and restrooms. A telephone booth was set into the wall like a separate room. At this depot in 1950, the state-winning Menasha Legion Junior Baseball team was met by 500 cheering fans after their return from the national tournament. Even though they were eliminated, the team was paraded to the Menasha Ballpark, accompanied by marching bands. The first passenger train stopped at Nina's new Sioux Line Depot on October 8, 1951. The last regular Sioux Line passenger train to stop at the depot was on January 15, 1965. The Sioux Line abandoned this facility in 1968. The building is long gone, but the foundation is still visible today. Now let's look at the three Chicago Northwestern depots. The first Chicago Northwestern Depot was located on Commercial Street, where the Galloway Company is located now. It was situated where the rail made its bend to leave the city and make its way to Appleton. Built in 1861, by year's end, traffic was swift. As trains, as two trains a day were running between Nina and Oshkosh, shipping over 2,000 barrels of flour to Chicago. A new depot, however, was going to be needed as the additional rail through Doty Island would change logistics. A second Chicago Northwestern Depot was built on Commercial Street in 1862 and located where the Jersel Building is now. It was a wooden passenger depot 
with a freight with a brick freight depot, water tank, and a small engine house across the tracks. Flanked on both sides of the tracks, it would handle a million ton of inbound and outbound freight over the next hundred years. A third depot, still standing on Commercial Street, cost $30,000 to build in 1892. We covered the details of the building and the impact the freight of the business earlier in the presentation. Now let's discuss how it positively affected the community. The citizens took pride in having a train depot larger, a train depot larger than nearby Appleton and Oshkosh. For many years, the freight and passenger traffic far exceeded the activity on both depots, closely matching Milwaukee's in number. Doty Island's depot handled 14 passenger trains a day. Even though the Appleton Depot was built a year ahead of Nina's, here is what the Appleton Post Crescent wrote of our new facility. A gilt edge depot. The Northwestern Railway Company has contracted with Decker and Gindle of Chicago for the erection of an elegant new station on the island for the accommodation of Nina and Menasha. The new depot is to be built opposite the old station and will cost $20,000. The style is to be similar to the Oshkosh station. The foundation is to be Duck Creek stone surmounted by Bayfield brownstone and St. Louis pressed brick. The Nina and Menasha people will be so stuck up that they won't come to Appleton to start south out of a decent depot when they decide to go to Milwaukee or Chicago to do their shopping. The Wisconsin Central is also building a handsome new depot at Nina, and it is a quiet race as to which road shall be able to boast of having the handsomest depot. In 1942, the depot was renovated. Some of those, uh, some of those renovations included bricking in the windows above the canopy, enclosing the baggage room, adding a drop ceiling, and removing the ticket window. The train depot, remodeled in 1992 to be more, a more modern building, is owned by Greece, uh, uh, Greece Architectural Group. Let us take a look at some of the rich history surrounding this remarkable building. The depot quickly became the center point of transportation for the visitors to Nina and Menasha. The railway station was strategi strategically located on Doty Island, so service to both cities was easily accessible. In the early days, pictured lower right, were the transfer horse-drawn horse stage carriages provided free by the Langraf Hotel. They were always ready to take passengers over the Taco Street Bridge to lodge in Menasha. Later, lower left, Hotel Menasha's transportation met all trains at the Chicago Northwestern Depot. The upper photo shows the conveyances used to transport passengers from the depot directly to their hotel. Notice behind the second vehicle, the early gas pumps with a clear glass cylinder of five gallons of gas. This was to allow the driver to see if the gas was dirty, a big problem at the time. The depot became the center of much activity. Many civic activities were organized and centered at the railroad depot. One article describes a milkweed pod collection organized by the Jasperson Feed Store. 1,000 bags filled with milkweed pods were collected by schools and organizations. The milkweed pods were used and collected in order to use the cottony seed within them for life vests and other articles for our armed forces. Another article details the collection of contributions for the Greek War Relief. The Valley Depots collected 5,000 items for the national effort, 3,000 from the Nina facility. The lower right article explained the 1946 send-off of 250 local baseball fans to 
to see Menasha's Dave Coslow pitch for the New York Giants against the Cubs at Wrigley Field. The full day trip, sponsored by the Menasha Lions Club, was to honor our local hero. The other two photos show the famed Flying Scotsman steam locomotive on its way to be displayed in Green Bay at the Railroad Museum in 1970. Flying the British Union Jack and the American flag, the British crew blew the piercing horn. A retired railroad conductor, uniformed in dark, familiar dark blue and gold, saluted it as it passed. The six-car exhibit included an Edwardian club car and two command cars used by both General Eisenhower and Sir Winston Churchill um, during World War II. For decades, the circus came to town. Before houses and businesses were built in the northern end of the depot, it was a wide open lot. As the circus train came into town, young and old alike would come to the depot and watch the animals unload. Here is how the Nina Times described the 1916 Al Barnes Four Ring Circus arrival. For the second time within the past two weeks, the C and NW depot has been the center of attraction. This morning, it was not the departure of troops that drew hundreds of people to the vicinity of the station, but the arrival and unloading of a circus. The Al G. Barnes Circus Train pulled in shortly after 4 o'clock a.m. today and at once began unloading. Even before the train arrived, crowds were on hand to witness the unusual spectacle. Nina has not had a regular circus day for some years and the sight was more or less of a novelty to the natives. Some, especially the younger generation, went so far as to arise at unusual hours in order to be on hand. In the days of railroad travel, politicians used it to reach out and meet their constituents. On August 9, 1934, President Franklin Roosevelt was in Green Bay for a major speech on his New Deal. On his return to Chicago, they made a pass through our Doty Island Depot. Mill whistles were blown as the presidential train left Appleton Junction, a signal to alert those interested to assemble at the depot. Roads were so congested that many left their cars and walked. All three high school bands were secured to give a concert while hundreds waited for the train to pass and catch a glimpse of the president. The train slowed as the president acknowledged the large gathering. In his 1940 presidential run, Tom Dewey made a two-day Wisconsin visit by train. The train made several stops on its route from Green Bay to Milwaukee. The Republican candidate for president spoke from the back of his special train in Kokona, Appleton, and Nina Menasha. The lower center picture is of his stop in Appleton. The upper right picture is of the 1952 presidential candidate Dwight Eisenhower's campaign stop in Oshkosh. He made earlier stops in the Nina Menasha area and Appleton with many local supporters waving vote for Ike signs. Again, in 1968, a whistle stop tour of the Nelson La Follette campaign came to the Nina Depot. Buses were on hand to take them to a dinner at St. Mary's Church Hall in Menasha. The most memorable, heart wrenching, and heartwarming scenes from the Nina Depot were the times of our brave soldiers going off to and coming back from war. From the beginning of the rail system, it was a major way to take soldiers off to war. In the 1860s, when the Chicago and Northwestern Rail connected us to the big cities, our soldiers, many of whom had never been off of their family farms, were sent to war in the South. World War I took our company I to Europe. A picture shows uh, the welcoming home of these brave men that fought valiantly, being recognized uh, for being the first Allied unit to break up the famed Hindenburg Line. An additional photo on this slide was the sending off of Company I, 127th Infantry Regiment, as they were bound for Camp Beauregard in Louisiana. They gathered at the armory, being mustered into World War II to be sent to the Pacific Theater. An article in the Menasha Record stated, the boys were given a rousing send-off by the cities of Nina and Menasha, whose people gathered upon the streets to see them on parade as they marched to the depot for entrainment to the southern camp. 
Many military families saw similar goodbyes, some of those less public. As one soldier's wife put it, the station brings back some sad memories for me. When my husband was in the army, after being home on leave, he would board the train to return to base. As the train was pulling away, I'd sit in my car watching, crying my eyes out, knowing it might be the last time I will see him. We've had several celebrities come to our area through the railroad system and to our community. Al Capone was often in the area. As related by locals of the time, as Capone came to his many northern Wisconsin hideouts to get away from the coppers and rival gang members, his train would make a stopover for a connecting line. Mr. Capone, waiting for his connecting train, would deboard, find a bench in the lobby, and smoke a cigar or two. The layover was usually a half hour. Everyone in the area knew who he was, but they gave him the courtesy of leaving him alone. Capone also made several trips on the Flambeau 211 to visit his brother Ralph at the family lodge in Mercer. The northbound 211 departed Chicago and stopped here at 4.30 p.m. bound for Eagle River. Also using the Northwestern's northbound 211 was the Comiskey family, the owners of the Chicago White Sox. Every summer they would be seen going to their large estate in Eagle River. They were easily seen as Mr. Comiskey had a custom green Pullman car for family and friends to travel in. When the Comiskey Pullman was northbound, usually on a Friday, scores of young and old baseball fans would be waiting at the depot for a glimpse of old Chuck Comiskey himself. Mr. Comiskey always accommodated his fans by briefly waving at the rear door, but no autographs as the Flambeau 211 was a fast train. In 1931, Mr. Comiskey died suddenly at the estate and hunting cabin in Eagle River. Scores of Valley residents stood at the depot to pay tribute to this baseball player and franchise owner as the casket in the green Comiskey Pullman passed by on its way to Chicago. As fate would have it, his son Lewis, also president of the White Sox, would die of a heart attack eight years later on the same family 600-acre estate. For three years in the 1940s, the Doty Tennis Club on Doty Island held a national tennis tournament. Many of the national tennis celebrities arrived by rail for the event. In this um, slide, you can see um, a picture of some of these players arriving through the Chicago and Northwestern Depot. On February 11, 1935, just two years before her disappearance, Amelia Earhart arrived in Nina at the Chicago and Northwestern station from the 116 northbound train. Helen Kimberly Stewart invited Earhart to give a speech de detailing her adventures in flight. During her stay, which lasted less than 24 hours, Earhart lectured at the S.A. Cook Armory, greeted youngsters, and signed autographs. We have secured a video of Amelia exiting the train at the depot, along with a short clip on President Eisenhower's visit. We hope you'll enjoy this clip and enjoy the words of Amelia Earhart as they were recorded. Even a dirty little town can be beautiful from the air, Amelia Earhart Putnam commented here Monday afternoon, her chin cupped in her hand and her eyes fixed on far places. She told of the beauty of flying. I love the air in the same manner that a sailor loves the sea, she explained their satisfaction of an inner urge and an inarticulate desire for self-expression in flying, she said. There is no time for philosophy while flying, Miss Earhart said, in answering a question as to what she thinks about while in the air. On my Pacific flight, I was in radio communication with land every half hour, and the dials on my instrument panel had to be checked during each interval. Miss Earhart continues, even my husband doesn't introduce me by any other name but my own, she explained. When one is driving an automobile and a car darts out ahead, forcing us to swerve to the side, we get a thrill and we forget the incident in 10 minutes or so. Flying brings exhilaration, but not thrills, she contended. The Chicago Northwestern provided the first rail service to our area in 1861. 
Thirty years later, their depot on Commercial Street provided an exceptional facility for passenger travel. Politicians and celebrities are not the main passengers to ride these trains. Local business travel and everyday citizens rode the rails daily. The last Chicago Northwestern passenger train stopped at Nina Menasha at the, at the Nina, Nina Menasha Depot, April 30th, 1971. Pictured on the left is a signed travel schedule by engineer Raymond Duff from that last trip. In our past presentations, we provided or we utilized social media memories and comments to become our voices of the past. Even after 50 years, memories of these many trips remain in our hearts. Let's listen to the thoughts and remembrance and remember their, their journeys. I went to Milwaukee on the train every year with my aunt and uncle. We went shopping and to the zoo. A big thrill was the double-decker train. I rode the train often to Chicago for business and to Milwaukee for fun. Also to St. Paul a few times on the double-decker with a great dining car. We even went from Menasha to New York for a vacation. Great memories. I grew up on Abbey Avenue in Nina. In 1966, I took the train from Oshkosh to Nina for only 35 cents. I used that station for catching trains all the time, including Menasha High School's trip to Washington, D.C. and New York City. My mom has a picture of me posing with the conductor as we took the last passenger train ride for a school field trip. That was when I was in kindergarten. That picture made the front page of the newspaper. Wow, my parents used to take us on that train to Chicago to see the Christmas store windows, and we'd stay at the Palmer House, a magical trip. My grandma lived across the street from the depot on Commercial Street. I loved sitting on her front porch and watching the trains come and go, hearing that whistle blow. What wonderful memories. My aunt took me shopping for school clothes every September to Milwaukee and Chicago on the trains. I loved the train station. I would go to Kenosha on the train with my grandma to vi visit relatives. I wish it would come back. We took the train with our Girl Scout troop. We went shopping in Green Bay for the day, lunch out, and sightseeing. It was such a fun day, and on a double-decker car, we bought whoopee cushions and entertained the other passengers on the way home. I was in kindergarten for my first train ride. It was from Nina Menasha to Appleton. We rode the steamliner several times to Chicago. My dad would go to Chicago for merchandise conventions. I remember waiting for him to come home on the 8.10 p.m. train. The platform would vibrate the closer the train got. I knew it well as we went back and forth to Chicago when I was in school. One April, there was a snowstorm. We went back to Chicago with no heat or electricity, and we were at least two hours late. What a ride. My mom took my sister and me to Chicago for a day trip. I remember eating Rice Krispies for breakfast on the train. It was such a special treat and a special memory. When I first moved to Milwaukee to work at U.S. Steel Corporation, I used to take this train home almost every weekend. This was in the early 60s. Good memories. My grandmother took us to Ohio on that train to visit relatives. We got to ride on a double-decker up front on the top. I played with buying Barbies to pass the time. Good memories. We've covered a lot of ground this evening, so many dates, so many events. It was a pleasure presenting this program today. We thank you for taking the time to watch this presentation, and we hope you enjoyed it. We will leave you tonight with the 1864 Chicago and Northwestern commentary in the Chicago Rail Gazette concerning our area and why they were focusing such energy here our water power. The Chicago Railroad Gazette gives some interesting statistics of the water power and manufacturing interests of the Fox River Valley. 
and we extract such as are of special interest to our readers. In speaking of the Chicago and Northwestern Railroad and the country through which it passes, it says, Nina and Venasha are situated immediately at the outlet of Lake Winnebago and the advantages these villages have for a never failing water power are not surpassed in the whole country. The Gazette goes on, at Menasha, there is an immense tub, pail, and churn factory, several sash and door factories, furniture and barrel factories, etc. At Nina, the dozen or more of mills are devoted to flour and lumber. All kinds of hard and soft timber is abundant in the adjacent forests. And when we consider that the railroad and river are at their very doors to convey manufactured articles, to any point of the compass, this is the most advantageous point we know of for establishing an extensive railroad car. <laughs>